Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it. We thank you for it being written in our heart and mind. We'll be doers of it and see the results of it, the fruit of it in our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you a series of messages on the subject of the fact that you and I are firstborn citizens of heaven and we are to live as firstborn citizens of heaven here on earth because you've been born from above. Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and church, not of the firstborn. Instead, there's no definite article in the Greek as we have pointed out. For those of you who may be here and have not seen this, here is the word here that we see for church. There's no definite article after that in the Greek. The next word is the word firstborn, and it's not singular, it is plural. And because it's plural, that means it's an adjective, and it's speaking of the church of firstborns, meaning it's speaking of all those who are a firstborn. That's what happens when you receive Jesus. You're born from above. You get a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. This is speaking an important thing. When it speaks of the just men, these are righteous ones. Again, this is the word for righteous. And at the same time, we see this also is talking about those ones who, as they are righteous ones, plural, meaning that they have been walking in the ways of righteousness. They have the fruits of righteousness. They've been shown to be righteous. They're the righteous ones, as it says, having been made perfect. And that is important because the word made perfect in the Greek, and if you're here for the first time, we explain these things. Clearly, they're important to understand. The tense voice and mood in the Greek is extremely important to understand what's being said. The perfect tense in the Greek means completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking, which means that this is speaking of those ones who are righteous ones who've been doing righteousness, the fruits of righteousness, having been made perfect in the past because of what they've done with the present results at the time of speaking, meaning the work was accomplished in them. And this is what we're going to be talking about tonight because we have talked about many important things, uh, how we're to walk in spirit and the last time together, we talked about how we're the called, the chosen, and faithful because those are the only ones that are going to be coming back with Jesus. Revelation, we saw this in 17, chapter 17, verse 14. When it speaks of when Jesus is coming back and the nations make war with the Lamb, the Lamb will overcome him. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings. Who's coming back with him from the marriage? They that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. We've been called, but many are called, few are chosen, because you have to respond to the call of God. And then those who have been chosen also are to be found faithful, which is mandatory. So if you're faithful, God then will promote you, and he will place you in a position of authority in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. We must be faithful, good and faithful servants if we're going to be entering into the joy of the Lord and be promoted. Now, we see that going on to perfection is what God expects of us after we have the foundation laid in our life. Hebrews chapter 6. As citizen, firstborn citizens of heaven, we now live according to the word of God in spirit. Hebrews 6, 1, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ. The doctrine of Christ is the word that we get in us, showing us the true doctrine that we walk in his ways. Let us go on unto perfection. Meaning once the foundation has been laid here in our life by hearing and doing the word, we're going now are to go on into perfection. He wants you to come to the place of being perfect and he will accomplish that work in you as you hear and do what he says. When it says go on here, 
to perfection. This is going to show you that it's going to be an ongoing work in your life because it's a present tense verb, meaning we're going on continuously. Present tense means continuous action. At the same time, does it happen for everybody automatically? No. It depends on whether they do what's necessary to see it happen. Why we say that? Because this is what's called the subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood is a conditional statement. It is not automatic. It depends upon conditions being met. Also, this happens to be what's a pa called a passive voice. A passive voice means the subject, which is you and me, are being acted upon by somebody else. And who's that? That's God who's doing the work. So this is saying, you and I are to continually be going on if we meet the conditions under perfection, which is a work being done by God. And He will do that work. We just simply have to meet the conditions and do the things that He says. And notice He says, not laying again the foundation. The foundation should already be laid. In fact, you can't go on to perfection unless you have the foundation laid. And how is the foundation laid? By hearing and doing the Word consistently. As you hear and do the Word so it becomes your lifestyle, what you hear and do, that's the way you walk, the way you think, the way you do everything, then that foundation laid, you're established in it, in the Word of God, the doctrine of Christ. Then we're going to go on to perfection. And notice the foundational principles of hearing and doing the Word include repentance from dead works. Well, that means we're not going to walk in sin any longer. We're going to change our mind. We're going to turn away from anything that's not of God. We're only going to walk in the good works of the Lord, being obedient to His Word. And of faith towards God, because faith is how we receive promises. Faith is how we gain victory over the world. Faith is how we're going to conquer every evil spirit's work in our life, how we're going to move mountains, how we're going to see God accomplish everything. We walk by faith, not by sight, in spirit to see Him accomplish everything in our life. And you're going to come to that place of always operating in faith. Of the doctrine of baptisms, it is plural in the Greek. This is important to understand because remember, every one of these things are all what God does from heaven because now we're firstborn citizens of heaven. And when it speaks of the doctrines of baptisms, there's two baptisms. There's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then there is water baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what produces the new birth and brings us into the body of Christ. For those of you who are not aware of this, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. When do we come into the body of Christ? When we're born again. What does baptism mean? It is an untranslated Greek word, baptizo. In the lower window, we bring up this information that we talked to you about. This is the Greek word, baptizo. They made an English word out of it, baptize. Doesn't tell you what it means. What's it mean? It means to immerse or submerge in something. When we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and immerses us in the presence of the Holy Spirit, takes the old spirit out and puts a new spirit in. There's an exchange that occurs and you get a brand new spirit, you become a new creation. That's what happens at the new birth and that is what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. Many have not understood that, but that's what it is. Now, that's what brings us into relationship with the Father, having received Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Water baptism has nothing to do with getting a brand new spirit. It has nothing to do with washing away sins. Remember, baptism with water is the answer of a good conscience before God of what has happened on the inside of us, that we have been born again, that we now are from heaven. We're not of this world any longer. And also the fact that we now have committed that we're going to follow the way of the Lord. We're through with the world. We are following the way of the Lord and we're letting everybody know that we belong to Him and are following the way of the, of the Word of God according to heaven's ways. That's what water baptism is declaring. You also that you've come into the priesthood and that you now 
are following the way of the Lord. You're through with this way of this world. It is the answer of a good conscience toward God because you can't be a closet Christian. You gotta, be a, you gotta declare to everybody and show the fact that you belong to Jesus Christ and you are following the way of the New Testament according to the way of heaven as a firstborn citizen of heaven, the way of the Spirit. Remember that Jesus said his words, which is what now we are following after in the New Testament era which we are in, John 6, 63, it's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Everything that you're going to be doing now as a born again Christian is gonna be operating in spirit as a citizen of heaven, operating as a firstborn, doing what the word of God says at all times. We go back to Hebrews 6, 1. These are the things to be established in us. Therefore, we understand we've been born, we've been born again by the baptism of the Holy, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit occurred, receiving Jesus, and then we have brought forth the baptism of water, declaring that we belong to Jesus. We aren't have anything to do with this world anymore. We're through with this world, and also then the laying on of hands. What's the laying on of hands do? It transfers things into you. How spiritually? Because of what? Because of the spirit that comes on the inside of you. And this is why first you get born again, you get the spirit of Jesus Christ. Then what? Then you're to receive the Holy Spirit, which is received after you're born again, because who is going to accomplish these things flowing through you? It's the Holy Spirit. The laying on of hands will bring the Holy Spirit into people. The laying on of hands releases the power of the Holy Spirit out of a person into another person. Laying on of hands is a doctrine that brings forth the manifestation of the power of God. You release healing, you release the power of God and the anointing when you're ministering deliverance. You lay hands on people. Yeah, it's people that think you shouldn't lay hands on them is wrong. You should lay hands on them as long as they're right with God. Now it does say lay hands on no man suddenly or you'd be a partaker of their sins. That's if they're not right. So you don't go ministering things that are of God to anybody that's not right with God. They have to be born again and walking right if you're going to minister the laying on of hands. But that's gonna transmit the power of God and the presence of God and the things of God into a person. And resurrection of the dead, that means there is a resurrection of the dead. Everybody is going to experience a resurrection of the dead because you're going to be judged then as the eternal judgment those that are the righteous are going to, of course, be into eternal life, but those that are the unrighteous are going to be into eternal judgment, and they are going to be in the lake of fire as they are not going to be with him. These are doctrinal principles that are to be established in every single one of us. Having these understood, then now we're going to go on into perfection. Perfection is you now are coming to be perfect before God. If you're perfect before God, you're going to be without blemish. You're going to be without walking in any ways of sin. You're going to be walking in all the ways of the Word of God. You're going to be blameless. You're going to be without rebuke. You're going to be unrebukable and reprovable in His sight. You must understand God will do this work in you and bring you to this place if you hear and do the Word. Luke chapter 1, verse 6 tells us something. This is speaking about here, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Notice they were in the Old Testament era before anybody was born again. So this is talking about the Old Testament era. They were both righteous before God, which would be accounted righteous. How? Why? Walking in all the commandments and the ordinance of the Lord, blameless. Well, they were, there were ones who could walk blameless in the Old Testament laws and commandments. If they could walk blameless in the Old Testament laws and commandments and they weren't even born again, there's no reason in the world that you and I cannot walk blameless in the Old and New Testament commandments having been born again with a brand new spirit on the inside of us. That is what we are going to do. They did it, we do it as well, and God accomplishes this work. We also see that Paul was one who also was so 
skilled and understood about the ways of old, the Old Testament commandments and the righteousness of the law. It says concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which of the law, he was blameless. He was walking blameless just as well. Of course, it wouldn't produce anything because you couldn't receive Jesus because of the law. It had to be getting a brand new spirit by receiving Jesus, getting becoming a new creation to come into relationship with the Father so you would then have come now in relationship to Him so you could walk in the New Testament law which will produce the results. Nonetheless, touching the righteous of the law, they did walk blameless. That meant they did exactly what it said. And yet it wouldn't produce, of course, the results that it can't, couldn't produce in the Old Testament. As we know, well, Hebrews chapter 7 even tells us over here, Hebrews chapter 7, in verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? Could the Old Testament law produce perfection? No, not at all. Verse 19 makes it clear. For the law made nothing perfect. I'm talking about the Old Testament law. But the bringing of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. The New Testament law that we're under is the law of Christ. And that will produce the perfection in us they could not come to the place of being perfect in the Old Testament, even though they would walk in it blameless. Nonetheless, it would not produce that. Also, we even see further in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 9. Here he's speaking about the first tabernacle, which was pointing towards what was going to come. It was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices under the Old Testament that could not make him that did the service perfect. It couldn't produce perfection whatsoever as pertaining to the conscience. It couldn't change the conscience on the inside of him. It had to be the blood of Jesus that going, was going to cleanse and purge the conscience from all of the dead works. We also see the law, it further says in Hebrews 10.1, the law, Old Testament law, having a shadow or a type pointing towards the good things to come in the New Testament era, not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, none of the Old Testament sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually, none of them could make the comers thereto perfect. It couldn't produce it. So there was no perfection under the Old Testament law, but there is perfection under the New Testament. And you and I are going on to perfection because the ones that are in heaven are the righteous ones having been made perfect, the work accomplished in them. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, speaking about Jesus. This man, when he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Remember, his sacrifice was one, one, one time, did it all, there was no need for it after that whatsoever. It goes on, verse 14. For by one offering, he has perfected or made perfect forever who? Everybody who has been born again. And this is a critical scripture to understand because many people think that, well, he's perfected them forever, meaning everybody who's born again automatically. Not so. Look what it goes on and says. He hath perfected, made perfect, completed action in the past with present results as a perfect tense. Who? Them that are sanctified. Does that mean just when they're born again? No. How do we know? Because it's not talking about a one-time event. Instead, it's talking about an ongoing work being accomplished. This is the present tense, continuous ongoing action. This is critical to understand, meaning they, them who are being ongoingly sanctified. And furthermore, 
this shows you that it's a work that God is going to accomplish because it's a passive voice. The passive voice means the subject, which is speaking of us, is being affected by somebody else. Who's that? God. This is critical to understand. By one offering, Jesus accomplished the means for perfection for every single person who are what? Ongoingly being sanctified, meaning the work has to be ongoingly accomplished in that person, not just being born again. We get sanctified in spirit when we receive a new spirit, but sanctification is a complete work, spirit, soul, and body. We're to be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body, to be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. God will do that tremendous work in us. So, in order to see this perfecting work, we must understand what's necessary because you are going to go on to perfection in your life, so you are going to be one of the ones who are in heaven. That is critical to understand. First of all, we see in Matthew chapter 5, we'll be seeing many things that are important to understand of what God will do and what you are to do to see him accomplish this work to bring you to perfection, to be as one of the firstborn citizens of heaven, having been made perfect, remember. Matthew chapter 5. And this also shows us that the Old Testament law, of course, it's been changed, it's been eliminated. And there's a New Testament law now, the law of Christ. Look what it says in verse 43 of Matthew 5. You've heard that it's been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's the Old Testament. Is that going to produce perfection? Absolutely not. You can't be hating your enemy and be right with God whatsoever. You're not supposed to have hatred whatsoever. Look what Jesus says, but I say unto you, what's he telling them? I'm telling you the New Testament law that's coming into manifestation when the New Testament comes in force. And this is what you and I are to walk by. Love your enemies. This shows the Old Testament law is finished, done, obsolete. We do not walk according to it. Because you can't hate your enemies and love your enemies at the same time. Loving your enemies is what we do in the New Testament. You bless them that curse you as well. You never retaliate against people. You don't send curses back at someone, never. You do good to them that hate you. Otherwise, you give people what they have need of. You don't give them what they deserve. If you give them what they deserve, you just made yourself a judge, and you're going to be judged. Judge not, lest you be judged. Instead, you give people what you have need of. You do unto men as you would have them do unto you. It doesn't matter what they did to you. It's irrelevant. You do to them what you would have them to do unto you. You give them what they have need of. That's the way we operate in the New Testament. Well, that means you can't be holding grudges, you can't have unforgiveness, you can't be bitter, you can't be retaliatory. If so, you're not right with God. You'll never get to perfection, that's for sure. You'll be walking in sin, see. And we pray for them that despitefully use us. That would include people that insult us or treat us abusively or use us dis despitefully or revile us, accuse us even falsely. All these kind of things happen. You can't be moved by it. You're going to pray for those that do these things and that might persecute you. And notice why this is important. That you may become, not be, it's the word ginomai, which means become. We point these things out when there's mistakes in the translation. That you may become, the, not children, but this is the word huios, which means sons. That you may become the sons of your father. Meaning, who are the sons of the Father? The ones who have met the conditions. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you are then going to be shown to be the sons of the Father. That you may become the sons of the Father. And that is important. And the reason we say may become is, which it does translate may be, it may is correctly because it's a subjunctive mood, which means a conditional statement. Otherwise, if you meet the conditions of verse 44, you'll see the results of verse 45, that you will may become, having met the conditions, the sons of your Father which is in heaven. 
Now, also, we come down to verse 48, and we see important thing. Many people think that, well, trying to, to be perfect sounds like a good thing, and I'll try to do my best. No, we're not going to do our best. It's going to get done if you're going to be right with God. Look what it says here. It looks like it's just telling you a command to be ye therefore perfect. Not a good translation whatsoever. Because what it's saying is you shall be, this is the word in here for the be, shall be, it's a future tense. If we put it over B, you see it here. Meaning, you shall be perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. That's why Young's translates it correctly. This is why we have Young's translation up here. It's got it correct. This didn't say, be perfect, you know, like a command. It's actually said, you shall therefore be perfect if you've met the conditions before, because God will produce perfection in your life. Every one of us are going to be perfect if we're going to be in heaven. Oh boy, that destroys the old once saved, always saved teaching. A lot of these things that think that everybody's going to make it, you know, kind of thing. It's all false teaching. It's not true. The Word of God is the truth. So, what's going to be something that's going to be required of you, of doing the Word, for God to bring you to the place of being the sons of your Father, so that you shall be perfect? It is that you are never going to be retaliatory or pay back. You're always going to be giving people what they have need of and always doing what is right in His sight, loving your enemies, blessing those that curse you, doing good to those that hate you, and praying for those that would do any kind of evil things to you whatsoever. We go on to Matthew 19. We see another thing important in verse 21. This is the man, remember, who was as a young man, he'd done all these things, and he was wanting to know here about whether he could enter into what was necessary to enter into eternal life. Well, that's pretty important. And this is back in Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. He said, Good Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? I want to have eternal life. What do I need to do to be having eternal life? And Jesus said there, why callest me good? There's none good but one. That's God. But if thou will, what says will enter, you have to understand what this is really saying. If you are willing, present tense, ongoing action, to enter. Why do we say that? Will is not a helper verb for enter. The word enter is a different Greek word, and it is a infinitive. An infinitive in Greek is just like an infinitive in English. So it would be translated to enter. That's why, again, Young's gets it. If, if you are willing to enter, you set your will to enter into life. He's answering his question. If you want to enter into eternal life, what are you going to do? You've got to keep the commandments. You've got to be keeping the commandments that he speaks up. Then, of course, he said, well, which? And Jesus starts quoting these Old Testament commandments and going through them. And the young man says, All these things have I kept from my youth up, but what lack I? What lack I yet? Is there something else that I need to do? And then Jesus, of course, knowing the problem that he had in his life, If thou will, again, the same thing, present tense, ongoing action, to be... Again, an infinitive. If you are willing to ongoingly to being perfect. Well, that's important. We've got to set our will to being perfect. What he say? Go and sell that you have. Give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. What was the problem? This guy had a lot of money. He had a lot of riches. He had a lot of things, possessions. And they had control of him. He had that as an idol in his life. What was his response? Did he say, okay, yeah, I'll do that? No. When the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions, meaning 
He had an idol of possessions and money and things. Well, that's not gonna, that's gonna hinder you from entering in. You can't have any idol before God and think that you're gonna be right and ever go on into perfection whatsoever. And remember what he's saying here, if you are willing to be perfect. He jumped right to it. Because remember, he's saying, oh, I've kept all these commandments. Well, Jesus just jumped right to what's going to be necessary. Not just, it's more than keeping the commandments. If you are really willing to be perfect, which is where you have to get to, to get to eternal life, you've got to get rid of this idol out of your life. And you've got to be coming and following him. And if you're going to follow him, you're going to be doing it continually, present tense, and it is a command. We can't be following ourselves. We've got to deny ourselves and crucify the flesh daily, and we've got to be following Him by walking in spirit in line with the Word of God. So that shows you another thing. If you have any idols in your life, you'll never get to perfection. You won't get to heaven. He's not going to have anybody with idols. You've got to get rid of anything. God's got to be your total source. Don't let anything, money, things, possessions, job, person, anything, be an idol before God. Can't have anything. We come to Luke chapter 6, verse 40. All those that live godly will suffer persecution, you know. And he says, the disciple is not above his master. Everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. And of course, what happened? Jesus went through all kinds of per persecution and different things, but also he's going, everyone that is going to be perfect shall be as his master, meaning we're going to walk the same walk that he walked. Remember, Jesus did not do anything of himself. He did everything that the Father told him to do. You and I are to be the same. We don't do anything of ourself. We do everything that the Word in the New Testament, which is coming from the Father, through, of course, Jesus, who's the Word, and the Holy Spirit revealing to us, we do everything that the Word of God says. So the ones who are hearing and doing the Word consistently, just like Jesus, are the ones that are going to go on into perfection. And that's what He wants to accomplish in you which he will. Another thing that's required, according to the word, for you to come to perfection is bringing forth fruit. What does fruit show? Fruit shows if we have the seed in the ground, it continues to grow. Nothing's going to hinder it. If there's anything to hinder it, like weeds or whatever, you get rid of it. But that seed grows and then eventually produces the fruit, showing the ongoing, continual work. Well, what's the seed? The seed is the Word of God. That's the seed in your heart and the seed in your mind. And if that seed continues in you because you hear and do it and walk in it and do, obey it, it's going to be ongoingly working, produce fruit. So in saying that you're going to be fruitful, it means the words work, your lifestyle. It's what you're doing continually. This is the way you live. This is talking about in the parable of the sower in Luke 8, 14. That which fell upon thorns are they that after they've heard, they got choked with the cares, riches, pleasures of this life and brought no fruit to perfection. Well, that was what hindered it. But notice the statement, brought no fruit to perfection, meaning the fruit was to come to perfection. You can't let anything stop the word from producing in your life. And remember, if it's, uh, temptation, you fall away, you didn't get any fruit. In Mark's account in Matthew, it talks about the affliction and the persecution. If they affect you and you turn away from the Word, no fruit. And as this one is indicating, if you have the cares, anxieties, or the riches, deceitfulness of riches, or the loss of other things, or pleasures of this life, because you're not living into God according to heaven's ways, you're living after the bios life, can't be doing that, you'll bring no fruit to perfection. And otherwise, what are you, how are you going to live? You're going to live as a firstborn citizen of heaven. Why? Because you're born from heaven. Where are you from? From heaven, which we've been driving home this point in all of these messages. Therefore, you don't live according to the flesh, or according to the world, or according to anything 
according to the natural. You live in spirit, according to the word of God that's spirit, according to the ways of heaven. That's the way you're going to bring forth the fruit, and fruit will be necessary to come to perfection because that shows you're hearing and doing the work. That's your lifestyle. That's what you follow after all the time. So fruit is necessary to come to perfection. And remember, who are the real disciples? The ones that bring forth much fruit, right? Remember what it says? You go, you bring forth fruit. You go through the cleansing process to bring forth more fruit. John 15, 8, here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Well, that's mean ongoing. That's the way you live all the time. Fruit, 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 because that's all that's going to be happening in your life. Because you hear and do the word. So shall you be my disciples. The real disciples are the disciplined ones that live according to the word. And they're the ones that are going to go on into perfection. You must understand Jesus' attitude must be your attitude. Remember, you're born from above. Therefore, you're going to live as firstborn citizens of heaven. You're not of this world, remember. Jesus came from above, remember. He said unto them, My meat, or my food, is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish or perfect and complete his work, to come to perfection his work. He had to do the things that he was necessary for him to do. So what did he come to do? He came to do the will of, of, the, of the Father. What are you going to need to do? Do the will of the Father. If we do the will of the Father, we're not doing our own thing. We're not walking according to the world or any ways of sin. We've denied ourselves. remember? Jesus said the first step is deny yourself, crucify that flesh daily. If you deny yourself, you lose sight of yourself because you're not living unto yourself. You're living unto Him. You have been purchased. Remember, you're bought with a price. You're not your own. You belong to Him. You cannot live unto yourself and be right with God. You'll never get to perfection. It's only those that are doing the will of God that's going to see it. John 17, we see verse 4. I've glorified thee on the earth. I've finished, perfected, completed the work which you gave me to do. That's what you and I are going to do as well. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And that's exactly what he, of course, accomplished. Well, we come down here to verse 24. He says, Father, I will that they also with whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. We're to have the same glory being manifest. In fact, if we go back to verse 22, the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them, that they may be one even as we are one. We're going to come to that place. And then look what he says after that. I and them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one. And those are the ones that are going to see the glory of God manifest in their life because that's the presence of God. You become one with him because you walk in his ways. You're becoming one with him as you're hearing and doing the word of God. And we're going to come to the place of being made perfect in one. That is going on to perfection. We're going to be perfect. Perfection is going to happen. And remember what we mentioned about the perfect tense. Completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking. Work having been done by God since its passive voice. Therefore... I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect. The work is accomplished in them with the present results. You're going to come to the place of being one with him. That means that's the only way you're going to be. You're not going to be any other way. Those that are going to be perfect are going to become one with him. They're going to be perfected into one. 
we also see in Romans chapter 12. It's important to see these things are showing what God will do in you through the word to bring you to the place of perfection. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And why is this important? Remember, your body is a body of death, and sin is dwelling in your flesh. So Paul said, I'm, do, I'm not doing the things I want to do. What was the problem? Sin was dwelling in his flesh. So what was the answer? With my mind, I'll serve the Lord, install the law of God, the law of Christ, the law of God. With the flesh, I would serve the law of sin. It means that's why you have to crucify the flesh and put to death the deeds of the body and not give place to it. And what do I do with this body? This is a body of death. I'm not going to let it sin. Remember, it is your slave. You present it wholly, even though it has sin in it, because you don't let it commit sin and yield get you to walk in that way because you make it your slave, you crucify it, you keep it under wraps, you put off and mortify the deeds of the body, put to death, you don't let it lead you and guide you in any wrong ways whatsoever. Remember the spirit is contrary and adverse and opposed to the flesh and the flesh opposed to it. That's why you have to walk in spirit according to the word, then you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's mandatory. So then he goes on and says, we also have to make sure we're not walking according to the ways of this age. Be not conformed, not to this world, but to this age, which is, of course, in the world, this age that's run by the devil, who's the, who's the ruler of this world system, remember. But ye be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is critical because that's why we were commanded to seek the things above, not the things on the earth. So we get the mind of Christ established in us, so we gain understanding in our mind. You're to be transformed by the renewing. This means the renovation, complete change. Your mind is gonna be completely changed because you're gonna get the word in it and you're gonna to think totally different than what you used to think before you were born again or even after you're born again until you got renewed. Otherwise, you're turning away from every fleshly way, every worldly thought way, every human being thought way, because we are now firstborns from heaven. We're only going to live according to heaven's ways. That's the way you're going to think. That's why, of course, you've got to think in every situation. What does the Word say? Then you're thinking to submit to that which is of spirit. If you don't think that and you just respond to whatever you think, you're going to be sinning left and right. You're not to walk according to your mind. You're to walk in spirit. Your mind is to get renewed to the Word. See, the Word, remember, it's written not only in your heart, but it's also written in your mind. So you can think correctly, because with the mind you'll serve the law of God. Notice what it says it'll cause a transforming effect, which is the Greek word metamorpho. Metamorpho is where we get the word metamorphosis. And if you remember from science class, metamorphosis is the process where the caterpillar is changed into the butterfly. That's a change in species. What's going to happen to you? You're going to be more metamorphosized, changed from a worldly-minded to a heavenly-minded, from a carnal minded to a spiritually minded, to a what I want to do minded to, no, I'm going to be totally submitted to what the Father wants me to do. That's the mindset you're going to have. This is going to happen through the renewing, complete renovation of your mind. And then you're going to be able to prove when you're examined and tested, because you will be tested to see whether you're, by all your works, by all your actions, am I doing what the Word says or not? <laughs> he sees it. How does he know us? By our fruit and by our works. Your works show what you're doing. Your fruit shows what you've been doing ongoingly, right? That I may pass the test in examination. There's a spiritual test. You're being tested every day. You say, what do you mean? I don't want to take any tests. You're being tested every day. It doesn't matter. 
you're under a test. Your mind's under a test all the time. All your faculties are under a test of what you're yielding to, see? And you're going to be tested to find out if you're going to pass the test of what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, people have misunderstood this. They thought these are three different types of the will of God. Well, there's the good, then there's the acceptable, then there's the perfect will of God. They're not nouns. They're all adjectives. That means they're not talking about three different kinds of the will of God. That is a mistake. Adjective. 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 Well, what's that tell us? I'm not talking about three different type of ones. They're adjectives describing the one will of God, which means that it is good and beneficial in effect, which is what this word means. It is well-pleasing. It's the only way you're going to please God. And it is perfecting, bringing you to perfection. Because you're walking in the will of God. There's only one will of God. It's the perfect will of God, the perfected will of God. The one that's well-pleasing is good and beneficial because you're either in the will of God or you're not. All these people that want to, you know, classify them different ways. It's all error. It's all false teaching. It's not right. And so we're going to be tested and examined whether we are seeing this good and beneficial, well-pleasing and perfected, perfecting will of God accomplished in us, depending upon whether you've gotten this mind transformed so that you think correctly. That's why your mind is critical. You've got to get the word in your mind. So you think on what the Word says before you just go and do things. Otherwise, you'll be making mistakes left and right. First Corinthians, so that shows us that to go on to perfection, you're going to get the mind of Christ established in you. Remember what it says? These guys understood this. Who's known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct them? You've got to know the mind of the Lord. You can't instruct anybody right because you won't tell them what the Word says. But we are having the mind of Christ ongoingly. These guys got the mind of Christ established in them because they were in the Word, hearing the Word, doing the Word, thinking on the Word. They understood all these things. They're living as a firstborn from heaven, citizen of heaven, on thinking what the Word says. You see, you have to understand, you want to major on seeking the things above. Colossians 3, 1, if you then be risen with Christ, meaning you've been born from spiritual death to spiritual life, born again, what do you do? Seek. This is a command to you and me. Present tense means ongoingly. Be seeking is the way you translate a present tense. Imperative mood, so it's a command to you, to me. So he's saying, I'm commanding you to be continually seeking the things that are above. Well, if I'm seeking the things that are above, why would I be doing anything seeking the things below? If I'm seeking the things below, I must not be on track for obeying this command that tells me to be continually seeking the things above. Set your affection to gain understanding, this means, on things above. Why? Because I want to know heaven's ways. See, once you get born again, you got a brand new spirit. But do you know how to live according to a firstborn citizen of heaven? No, you don't know anything yet. You got to start learning the word. And the Holy Spirit, when you receive him, he comes to dwell in you. And then he starts taking that word right in your heart and mind and bringing revelation as you hear and do it of the ways of heaven. And they get established in your lifestyle and you walk in it all the time. And that's how you bring forth fruit continually in your life. That's the way you think. That's the way you live. That's the way you function. And that's how you'll come to perfection because you have the mind of Christ. They had the mind of Christ. These guys, they were doing what needed to be done. We have to be doing what needs to be done. Don't waste your time on the things of this world outside of what you need to know to function in life. You need to learn all the ways above. Because you are a citizen of heaven, so why would you want to learn things? You're not of this world. 
You're from above, remember. When it says born again, remember the word again means from above. That's where you're from. Now, another thing. Remember it talked about them becoming one. It's going to happen because of the word being spoken into you. 1 Corinthians 2, 6 says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Well, how do you get wisdom? Knowledge, understanding, wisdom. Revelation knowledge, you do it, it'll produce spiritual understanding imparted to you, and as you walk in it, you'll have wisdom to know what to do in every situation. We're speaking wisdom of those that are per per perfect. That means they've gone on to perfection. They got the mind. They passed the tests. They got the mind of Christ. And they got, you, we can speak wisdom to these ones that are perfect because they walk according to the word all the time. That's the way they think. Not the wisdom of this world, age means, or nor the princes, the rulers of this age that come to naught. See, everything of the world has been corrupted. You don't want to follow worldly wisdom or you'll be going down the, the wrong path. You want to follow the ways of heaven. They are opposite to the things of this world, remember. We speak the wisdom of God to mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained from before the world for our glory. It was a hidden wisdom, but now, of course, it's revealed unto us that none of the rulers of this age knew it. The devils didn't know what was going on, or they, had they known it, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory for him to accomplish the redemption and bring the reconciliation and accomplish everything to bring the New Testament into being. And he says, I has not seen nor ear heard, or neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him or are loving him. Because that's another key. You've got to be loving him continually, ongoingly. And how are you loving him? Not just because I say I love him. You're loving him because you keep his commandments. Having his commandments and keeping them, he it is that loveth me. John 14, verse 21, remember. So all these things that God has prepared for those loving Him, He's revealed them unto us by His Spirit. That's if you're doing what the Word says, you'll get the revelation of it. Is He going to reveal it to someone who's not doing what is loving Him and keeping His commandments? No, you're not going to get any revelation. But He's going to reveal everything that He has for you as you're hearing and doing the Word. This is what God wants. And you and I are going to come to the place of becoming perfectly joined together as one, the few who are the true, perfected, glorious church in these end times. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. Why would we be speaking the same thing? Because we all have the Word in us, and that's all that's coming out of us. What do we see in the body of Christ today? we got doctrines after all over the place, they're not even close to speaking the same thing. That means they're all in error but one, or maybe they're all in error, you know? Can't be more than one of them that's right. The rest of them are all in error. Otherwise, they wouldn't be speaking different things. We're all to speak the same thing. That means we become one. That there be no divisions among you. What are denominations? Division makers. There are no, God that recognizes no denominations. They were rebellion to God. God only has one church, the church of firstborns. And that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind, we think the same, and in the same, this is referring to really the view or the way we are resolve, purpose, intention, what this really word means, the same view, or your, your, how you judge things and you, you purpose and intention, the way you see things, essentially. Now, why would that be? Because we have the mind of Christ. We're going to see things with the same mind. We're going to speak the same thing. We're going to be perfectly joined together because we're going to become one. How do, you become, how do you know you're one, whether you're in line with the Word of God or not? If you're contrary to the one, then we're not with one with Him. 
we don't want to be one with other people. We want to be one with him. And if we're one with him, other people that are one with him will be one with us. That's why you can't compromise with people. Well, I just want to be one with them. Well, you're making them, if they're not one with him, you're, you're going to be off. You've got to be in line with the Word of God on everything. That's, why, of course, why doctrine is extremely important. You're to be perfectly joined together with the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. Notice what it says here. Brethren, be not little young children. Padion is the word. In understanding. No, I'm supposed to grow up in understanding. I'm not supposed to be like a little child that doesn't understand much. They don't. They're just, they're, they're just learn, they've learned just a little bit, right? No, I'm supposed to grow up. Howbeit in malice, which would be doing evil things, what am I to be like? Be ye like an infant, a baby. A baby doesn't know anything, so I'm not supposed to be knowing any ill will or malice or anything against anybody. That's what that's saying. But an understanding... B, not men. This is a mistake, critical mistake. Instead, it means be perfect, the word teleos, which means be perfect. That's why he translates it the way it is. And the word here actually means become perfect because it's the word ginomai. You understand, you're understanding? Become perfect. This is the word that means perfect translated perfect correctly 17 times, a full age, which is talking about someone that went to perfection, and one time man, the word for man is anthropos, it's not this one whatsoever, should have never been translated that way. Great mistake. That's why you can, you got to look up all the words and the translations to find out if they're right or not. Understanding, become perfect. And when it says become ongoingly, present tense, imperative mood means it's a command to you and me. God's commanding you to continually become perfect. He'd never command us to be something if he wouldn't produce the results in us and we couldn't see it happen. Don't kick out anything thinking, well, you're talking about being perfect. That's right. Well, I don't see how I can ever be perfect. You throw that reasoning right out the window, it'll deceive you. You're becoming perfect. You're becoming perfect. You're becoming perfect. That's it. Or you're not going to be up there in heaven. Because it's the one, the righteous, just men, having been perfected. We get the foundation. We're going on to perfection. Who's Jesus going to present to himself? The ones that are perfect. Say, they is? Yeah. Colossians 1, verse 28. We preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect. You're becoming perfect. That's it. Get that set in your mind. That's where I'm headed. Don't rationalize any other way. No excuses. No, well, I don't see how it could be. Well, someone, someone told me I'll never be perfect. Always, always going to sin, you know. No, you're not. You're not a sinner any longer. You can conquer all sin. You have a righteous spirit. And all the things are shown, are given, written to you so you might not sin. You and I are going on to perfection. Well, that means we, got, we do have to get cleansed of all this filthy stuff out of our life. Because you're going to have to be holy. Who's Jesus presenting to himself? Those who are holy, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, unrebukable, unreprovable, holy ones. Well, that means I've got to be holy if I'm going to be there. In fact, remember, it says, follow, you follow after peace with all men, and without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Oh, if I'm not holy, I'm not going to be there with him. That's right. Look what it says. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, can I just claim these promises without doing some other things that are necessary? No. Well, I'm just going to lay hold of claim them because everybody says just claim the promises. 
Let's read the rest of this. Having these promises, dearly beloved, it doesn't say just claim your promises and everything's fine. No, it says let us cleanse ourselves. Well, you've got to cleanse yourself. Why don't people get the promises? They haven't cleansed themselves. <laughs> you got sin in the camp, you got all these things, how are you going to get the promises manifest? Let us cleanse ourselves. That is a subjunctive mood, meaning a conditional statement. Might we cleanse ourselves? Whose responsibility is it? Yours, because it's an active voice. You've got to do what needs to be done by doing the word, by confessing sin, repenting, turning away from it, resisting temptation. God's not going to make you do things. He's giving you a free will, and you have to choose. To, you know, he says, before you, life and death, blessing and cursing, choose. You set your will to choose. See? You're going to cleanse yourself from all the filthiness, anything that defiles you. And then it speaks of two categories of defilement. Of the flesh, that would be anything of, coming from the human nature, anything that was desires of the flesh, but also the filthiness of spirit. Well, what could that be? If I got a brand new spirit, it's the spirit of Jesus Christ. There's no filthiness in that. And if I receive the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in me, there's no filthiness in the Holy Spirit. So what's the filthiness of spirit? It's the evil spirits that are in you, in your soul and body, that you have to cast out. Therefore, we're going to cleanse ourselves of all the filthiness of the flesh, every sin area of the flesh. We're not going to have it, none of it. Anything, all the works of the flesh listed in Galatians 5, verse 19, 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, these other ones, Ephesians 5 talks about anything where it talks about these, anything that's of the flesh, any works of the flesh. They're defiling you. You can't have them. You're going to cleanse yourself from all the filthiness of the flesh and filthiness of the spirit, which is the evil spirits in you that you're going to cast out of your soul and body to drive them out. Just think of all these people that don't believe that they have demons in them and they don't cast out the demons. <laughs> Are they ever going to fulfill this scripture? No. And what's going to be the result of this? Perfecting holiness, bringing to the accomplishment of holiness and the fear of God. Will they ever become holy? No. We're going to be perfecting holiness and the fear of God. That's why you're to cast out all the demons and get rid of all the works of the flesh. You're to be on that road, remember, continually. Now, this is another thing that's important. The power of God is to work mightily in you, and it will. The devil has worked to deceive people about the teaching about Paul's thorn. Tradition says Paul was trying to exalt himself. So God was going to humble, get, bring him down, because he was exalting himself, being a big-headed person, and he's going to give him all these problems, and when God sought after him three times, he's, no, I'm going to leave you in that state, and you're just going to have to just put up with it. It's all a lie. It's false. Notice what it said. Lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, the conclusion by people is that he was exalting himself. Well, if it's, he's exalting himself, it has to be an active voice. I'm doing it. But it's not. It's a passive voice. What does that mean? Somebody else was exalting him. Was the devil exalting Paul? No. Who would be exalting Paul in the eyes of all the people so they receive the gospel? The Lord. God was exalting him. It's a passive voice. Lest I should be exalted by God above measure through the abundance of the revelations that God gave him, that he was given out to everybody everywhere so they'd get to the tr true revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Well, who was trying to stop him from being exalted then? The devil. The thorn in the flesh was the angelos, the angel of Satan. That's an evil spirit sent after him. To do what? 
to buffet me. God wasn't buffeting him. This is the devil striking and blow after blow, like time after time, continually striking at him. And notice also, though, you have to understand why this is so. It is subjunctive mood, meaning it's a conditional statement, because can the devil just strike us and smite us and pummel us just because he wants to regardless? No. Conditions have to be met. Because you have authority over all the power of the enemy, and you can, you can stop the works of the enemy. So the devil is coming at him to smite him continually. And how would he able to be able to do that if Paul didn't know his authority and didn't know what he could do to stop the works of the devil? And he didn't at first. The Corinthian letters were the early letters. Lest I might be exalted above measure, again, this is subjunctive mood, meaning somebody was trying to do it. God's the one who was working to do it. Present tense, ongoingly, he was to be exalted by God if conditions were met. The devil was trying to hinder him from being exalted. What do you look at the missionary journey? He got beat up left and right. He had to flee out of the city. He had to let him down through the, you know, the, out of the, out the wall to get him out of there. He was getting pummeled left and right at the beginning. So what did he do? For this thing I sought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. He's asking God to get rid of the devil three times. Who has authority over the devil? We do. Do we ask God to get rid of the devil? No. We use the authority and speak to the devil and resist the devil and he'll flee from you. It doesn't say ask God to get rid of the devil. It says Resist the devil and he'll flee from you, remember. Who's doing the resisting? We are. So who was supposed to deal successfully with the enemy? Paul. He didn't understand that. It didn't work by asking God. So what does he say to me? Listen to this, is important. My grace is sufficient for thee. People have interpreted that as my favor is sufficient for you. Just put up with it and just get pummeled. It's okay. That's my favor towards you. That's ridiculous. The word sufficient means, look closely, possessed of unfailing strength to defend and to ward off. In other words, my favor gives you unfailing strength to be able to defend and ward off for you, the enemy. He could conquer the enemy, saying, my grace will deliver you from this attacks, because grace brings deliverance. Boy, who's been teaching like this out there? They teach all this other false stuff about Paul's thorn. It's ridiculous. It's all lies. For my strength, dunamis, power, is the word, is, may, is perfected because the power of God will be perfected in you in weakness or lack of strength. And where would that be from? Where do you have lack of strength? In the flesh. Where do you have strength and power? In spirit, because you have a spirit of power. If you operate in spirit, you conquer. If you operate in flesh, <laughs> you won't conquer anything. The enemy will conquer you. He was trying to handle things in the flesh. If you try to handle things in the flesh, you'll get wiped out left and right. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my weaknesses. Same word. I'm, you know, I understand I got weakness in the flesh. It doesn't bother me. Because something else can be working that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And when the power of God will operate through the Word in you, and you operate with a spirit of power that you have, you're operating the spirit, you can conquer the devil and overcome every attack. He didn't know that. But he learned it, and then he got on track and started conquering all of the enemies. You don't have to put up with anything of the devil. 
You are commanded to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You are to be completely victorious in everything, remember. Well, that's not getting pummeled by the devil. <laughs> no way. You're to overcome and conquer everything. In fact, look what he says down here in chapter 13 for these people he's saying. We're glad we're weak, we're strong. Otherwise, yeah, we have weakness in the flesh here. We're weak and you're strong because these guys were becoming powerful and mighty through the word as it was coming into them. They were sowing it in them. And this also we pray, not wish. What are we praying? Your perfection. We pray for your perfection. You should be praying for everybody to come to perfection. But they, have, they can only come to perfection if they come in line with the Word. It's not going to happen without them getting in line with the Word and doing what needs to be done. Then he comes down in verse 11, and look what he says. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. And this is a little different word for, it's the word meaning to be complete, be put in order, be arranged, be repaired, be fit, be completed, sound. See this total work of restoration in your life. And when he says this, this is a command, present tense, ongoingly, you're to be perfected. At the same time, he's making a command of them but notice, it's not active voice that he's going to do it himself. It's passive voice. What does that mean? You're commanded to continually be perfected by God because it's passive voice. Because God's the one that's going to do it. You just have to do what he says and he'll do the work. You can't do it yourself. It's only God. That's why it's passive voice. Yet it's a command to you and me. It's to be done, and it's to be an ongoing work, present tense. That is quite a statement. Now, at the same time, you cannot let the flesh operate. Galatians 5, 16. This I say then, this is another mistake. Walk in the Spirit. It's a mistake. Two mistakes. Number one, there's no the in the Greek. Walk. This is the word walk. It's command, ongoingly. And this is the word, what's in the dative case, would be translated in spirit. Walk in spirit. There's no definite article. Furthermore, it's not talking about Holy Spirit. The capital letter is, was put in by the translator. It's not in the, there at all whatsoever. They put it in here. They stuck it in here, but it's not in there. In fact, all the Greek letters initially, originally, they were all in caps. <laughs> you look at the original manuscripts, they were all in caps. That's the way they were. This is not talking about walk in Holy Spirit. This is talking about walk in spirit. How do I walk in spirit? According to the Word of God. The Word is spirit. His words are spirit. And if you do that, you might not fulfill. The reason we say not shall not, that's a mistake. It's not a future tense. It's what's called an aorist tense, a simple statement. It's objunctive mood, conditional. It would say that you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So if I, if I fulfill the lust of the flesh, I'm going to be sinning, right? What's going to be the answer? Walk in spirit. That's the way we're going to function at all times. The flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. They are contrary. The word contrary means they're opposed and adverse to one another. Your flesh is against your spirit. And your spirit is against your flesh. That's the way it is. That's why, well, I don't feel like praying. Well, I don't feel like getting the word. Well, I don't feel like this. I'll feel, 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 feel. You're being run by the flesh. <laughs> well, I don't have a desire for such and such. Well, what's the spirit? What, what does the word say? Your spirit's ready and willing, remember. The flesh is weak, strengthless, and doesn't want to do anything right. There'll always be a resistance. 
That's why you've got to learn to not be moved by your feelings or your mind, thinking in your mind, if it's not in line with the Word. Men are reasoners. You can't reason in your mind or you'll make mistakes. Women are feelers, feelings. Nothing wrong with feelings. You just got to govern them. There's good feelings and that's fine, but feelings that are trying to run you, you can't be run by feelings or you're going to be led astray. You're going to be led according to the Word in spirit is the way you're going to function at all times. Praise God. But we've got a lot more to talk about, which we'll continue on. But let's go back to what we need to come to, understanding Hebrews chapter 12. Who's up there in heaven? The church of firstborns written in heaven, God a judge of all, to the spirits of righteous ones having been made perfect. And if we've been commanded to be perfect, well, I guess it's got to be done then. So who, who's going to be up in heaven? Only the ones that have seen it work, seen it been accomplished, right? I don't see any sinful ones up there. I don't see any fleshly guys up there. Perfected ones. Remember, we're commanded to be perfect. Remember what it said, you shall be perfect as your Father is perfect. That's right. That's why you got to know you're a firstborn citizen of heaven and you are going on the road to perfection. There's no other road. Well, I'm just trying to, you know, do some other things over here. You just got off the road to perfection. Well, I want to do what I want to do. Well, you're not on the road to perfection. You have to deny yourself. Well, I want some pleasures, you know, of the flesh and pleasures of this life. You just got off the road to perfection. We're going to deny ourselves and walk the straight and narrow path. Remember, it's only a few that enter into the eternal life. Many are called, but few are chosen. Why? Because they didn't make the right choice to answer the call. And remember who came back with Jesus? The called, the chosen, and the faithful. What does faithfulness show? Consistency. If I'm found faithful to do something, you can count on me. Well, how, why can he count on me? Because I got a track record. I'm always going to do it. He knows I'm always going to do the right thing. He knows that I'm not going to be, you know, flake out on him. It shows ongoing character of the Lord doing the word in your life. Otherwise, the perfected, completed work is accomplished with present results. That's why the perfect tense is so important in the Greek. That's where you're headed. We're going to be perfect, the perfected ones. And remember, he's preaching and warning every man that he might present them perfect. Because that's the only ones that are going to be presented to him, because that's the only ones that are up there. If you've never heard a message like this, and you've heard all these other messages, and you think, well, this was, I've never heard anything like this in my life. They always told me, you know, once saved, always saved. And, you know, God understands all your failings and all this stuff. You heard lies. What you heard tonight was the truth. The perfected ones are the ones who are with him. So he's commanded you and I to be perfect. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the word of God. That's the truth. And the perfected ones are the ones in heaven. I've been commanded to be perfected. I'm to be told that I'm to be perfect like my heavenly Father is. I see all these things that the Word declares. As I do what the Word says, God will accomplish this work and I will be perfected. I will come to perfection. 
I thank you. I'm going to meet the conditions and do everything you say. And I'm going to see your work accomplished in my life. I will go on to perfection and be one of the righteous ones having been made perfect. Thank you for accomplishing this in my life because I'm a hearer and a doer of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Father, I thank you that every one of us has ears to hear and we understand we just saw the truth. And we thank you. We're all going on to perfection. We will all be hearers and doers of the word and see this accomplished in us. Thank you for performing it in all of us who are the few who will obey and do what you say so you can accomplish this work. Thank you for us going on to perfection. And we praise you for this great work done in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.